I went to game dev school and all I got was this lousy book. So yeah, I actually, I actually went to game development school. I uh, went there back in, in 2014. Yeah, I had to do like, uh, took me like uh, seven years or something. Yeah, it, it was tough, man. Like I said, Corona, it coronavirus happens, you know, like uh, things got delayed. And it was also like tough, like, yeah, especially projects. Those are really tough because you got to like do a project while also like learning the thing you're supposed to do a project on. I had, to, I had to do a lot of second chances with that, but I got through it. And it was, yeah, it was back in 2014, man. 2014 was like, a, it was a different time, which is like obvious, sure. But it's like, you know, in hindsight, it's so weird. Cause like, you know, like I, I didn't know anything about game development yet. You know, I didn't know anything about game design, didn't know anything about programming. And we like didn't learn that much like uh, game design there. It's like a little bit, but like a lot I just learned on my own. Like just, um, you know, I guess the internet more, you know, really even like programming. Like you get a little bit of everything. You get, you know, like you get, uh, let's see what kind of, you got testing, I've had databases, uh, design patterns. That one was actually interesting, but it, it, it was kind of confusing because, you know, like you think like design pattern. Oh, how do I program that? Well, you, they don't really show you. It's just kind of like a, it's just kind of like an idea that you have to program, like you have to design it yourself, basically. It kind of difficult. There's like a really good website for that. That kind of helps, but you know, it's it's still difficult. You know, you still like you just need to, um, really going to game dev, game dev school. Uh, really, you just gotta pick something. It's better to just like just practice a lot. Like just just pick something and then just make games. Like just go, man. Like your diploma, eh, you know, like people don't, it's not that important, you know, really like if you have more experience, it's way better. You know, like I really gravitated towards like Unity and C Sharp because like uh, online, there's a lot, a lot of support for that. A lot of people explaining on how to do this, how to do that. Like I, I did not like Unreal Engine at all. Like if you're working like a large team, you know, at, at some company, like you have someone to like really teach you, you know, C++ and all that, then you got, that's a good idea. You know, if you're just on your own, like really like to pick something like that's easy to work with, you know, don't bother with like, don't people go like, oh yeah, Unity is bad, you know, Unreal is better, you know, like graphically sure, you know, it's really like ease of use is like, it's like so much, it's so much simpler. But yeah, you know, like 2014, man. you know, like that was like before like loot boxes really took off, like they did exist, you know, like I, was, I played Team Fortress 2 like a lot back then, you know, and like it really know about the loot boxes because really the... The thing that we were all worried about was uh, microtransactions, you know, pay to win microtransactions. I actually did like kind of like a, a paper, like a really bad one on why they're bad. You know, like, uh, <laughs> that was really funny because uh, we, we never had like a class on like monetization because you, you can do that. You can do you can do that. Even though like the whole, like the whole idea of getting to school to kind of get you to, uh, get you a job, like how to get a job, you know, you gotta like, uh, communication skills like it's really like it's it's really very job focused right to get you a job but like you you can't you can't go but do a bunch of gamers because everyone there was a gamer of course you know like you can't you can't go teach them about oh yeah so you, you, this is how you uh, loot boxes and this is some monetization it's like you can't really do that man so they just teach you to program like a whole bunch of things like android studio you know st stuff like that but there, when, uh, <laughs> well, actually going to your first year, it's uh, it, it's really weird because they really try to kind of, because game ga video games have not been around that long. So there really isn't a lot of scientific, like, like basis for it. So when they're teaching you how to do like game design well, well, even like in this book, like it's basically like, uh, just play test it. And if people like it, well, then, it, then it's good at game design. If people go, yes, I like this, then it's, it's good game design. Because that's scientific, right? You tested it in like the hypothesis, you know, it was correct, you know, and then you go through that with that, you know, is it, is it theoretically correct? No, is it like even like even morally correct? You know, like if people really like, uh, you know, pressing a button and watching numbers goes up, is that, is that really the best? No, but it's, it's effectively correct. And that's what they're going for there. Because, you know, like you got all these gamers, and some people there, you know, like, because even like, say me, like, not everyone who like joins up, 
or like uh, is he even gonna stay there for like more than like a few like a month or two because people like they're kind of dipping their toes in you know like a lot of people just like like yeah that's not for me because they really want to hammer it in this is this is gonna be tough this isn't gonna be like oh we're gonna be playing games not like those ads they used to run them in america where it's like Oh man, can you believe we're being paid for for testing games? You know, like they're doing like commercials. Cause uh, like being a game tester, you know, not not a fun job, man. Like uh, people even blame you if the game, like you know, if the programs don't have time to fix all the all the gl all the glitches you found, because the game gets pushed out by by like the by the CEOs and everything, you know, the marketing team and everything. You know, like people will blame you. <laughs> you know, like it's 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 a. Uh, you know, you get crunched a lot. You know, it's not it's not that fun. So it's not like, oh man, I'm being I'm being paid to play games. No. Because it was also like, it was really funny. Because they actually showed us this video. Actually, on the first day, they really tried to like pander to us a lot. And, and th what they did was they had like a video game music guessing, guessing game. Like, guess this music. Oh, is that is that from Castlevania Symphony of the Nights? Oh yes, is that from Ben Yukazooie? Do 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 boom boom boom. And you had to guess, you know, like even one of the teachers like walked up to me. It's like, what are the ghosts in Pac-Man called? And I'm like, Blinky, Inky, Pinky, and Clyde. Because I, I know that. I was born in the 80s, man. I mean, I wasn't, but I, I know that. Because they rhyme. And the orange one is the funny one, right? And then one of them is pink, and one of them is blue, like ink. And, and they blink. <laughs> it's, it's pretty easy to remember. But yeah, that's, that was really funny. But they actually showed us a video of like two robots. And the funny thing is like, one of the robots was like the, uh, the was like the, the, the voice of reason. And, and the other one was like the, the wide eyed, like naive robot, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play video games and make video games for a job. I'm gonna do what I, I'm gonna make my hobby my work. I want to bring my creativity and innovation to video games. The video game industry does not exist to be creative. It exists to sell products at Walmart. Most shoppers at Walmart do not want innovation. They want a game that lets them shoot robot Nazi zombie Pokemons and jump on platforms. And so the, the little robot is like, I want to be a game programmer. I want to make money programming games. And that was his voice. Like, I want to do this. And then the other robots and his voice is all like, well, actually, <laughs> being a good programmer, like, it's like really tough because in a company, you start out at the bottom. And so you'll be programming something boring, like a t-shirt, uh, like a texture. I'm going to program a texture. You're not going to program the platforming mechanics, which by the way, like fucking platforming mechanics, fucking difficult, man. Like, <laughs> you know, like how they say like Unity has like a bad physics engine. It does. But you're not supposed to use like the the build, the base one, like really like yeah, they call them framework engines because you still gotta like program your own engine basically. But you got like a framework for it. And like really, I use kinematics. Yeah, to uh, do my and then you can do all these raycasts and it, it's it's uh, like I felt like this tutorial. It's extremely complicated. Like <laughs> it's it's really tough. So being a programmer, freaking tough, man. Which which why I need experience? Like just go make go make garbage. You know, just make some garbage games. You know, like, don't even bother, like, oh, this is going to be the game, man. Uh, this is going to be the one to make me famous. No, like, it, just throw in the trash once you're done with it. Like, oh, like, if you're just stuck somewhere, throw in the trash, begin something new. Like, just make, 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 just make shit. Just make it and, like, learn when you need it. Like, oh, I want to I wanna try every game. You just put something new in, like, uh, let's try multiplayer. And then you just make some really shitty multiplayer, doesn't work well. And it's like, oh, well, I have a beginning here. I know a little bit how to do it. And then you just throw it away and you go do something else. That's like the best. But then the funny thing about the robots was then he would like shift. He would shift his tune like, uh, I want to be, be a game tester. I want to make money playing, uh, testing games and playing games. And then the robot, the other robot was like, well, actually, to play testing games really boring because, you know, like you're playing unfinished games. And what if you're, what if you're told to, what if your job is to play test Gollum, the video game? You know what then, like, then you die because you have to make all these tickets like, oh yeah, Gollum, uh, when you put Gollum's uh, hair physics on the maximum setting, the game glitches, it, like freezes instantly or something like that. You know, have to make like, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong. And programmers like, they know, the programmers know it's all wrong. 
But right? it's like, oh, feature done, boom, to the testers. You know, like, it's, it's fucking hell. Like, do you want that? You know, like, and then people blame you when the game's not good, when there's glitches. You know, you don't, you don't want that. You know, like, uh, Cyberpunk 277. Like, what do I do with this? It's, it's all a mess. Like, uh, you don't want that. <laughs> so then the robot is like, <laughs> uh, I want to be a game designer. I want, I want to design games. And then the other robot's like, well, like, well, actually, you know, being a game designer, that's a pretty high feature. Like, you're like the top dog. So they really like only want really experienced people. You're not getting got, like, being a game designer on the bottom. It doesn't work because you're basically the lead. Like, it it's, it doesn't work. And then he's like, "Well, uh, I I want to be I want to be the idea guy. I want to come up with game ideas." And then the other robot has to be like, "Well, everyone has ideas. You can just have an idea. You need to form it. it like, it may be not be a good idea, even if it sounds good. Like, I'll give you an idea right now. Uh, Mario Party Maker. Is that a good idea?" Uh, I thought about it and no, because first of all, you have to be like, well, what about the mini games? Do so you have to make your own mini games? And like, well, at that point, you know, like you're, it's kind of like why do you do it yourself for the DS? Like you're making your own micro games, you know, like it's it's a little bit too complex. You know, you're better off making a Mario Party mini game maker then. And even like the boards, you know, like Super Mario Maker levels, like you can play those in like a minute or three. Mario boards, you know, like. Who's gonna who's, who's gonna play all these new boards? Like there's gonna be like a million boards online, and like who's gonna play like a whole man? Like really, what you what you just need is every Mario Party game just needs like a stupid board. Like Mario Party Four had the extra room with the Twomps, like a Twomp and the Wumps, and one of those boards was just like no mini games, but there were like red spaces all over it. That was pretty cool. That was pretty funny. So really, like not a good idea. And like the robot has to be like you know like everyone has ideas. So like that video was just like to kind of discourage you. What were you good at in school? I don't know. I got these in all my classes. I spent all my time playing video games. But you know, I'm like just like, well, I'll just be an indie. And then I'll do everything. <laughs> I'll be the game designer and the programmer and then I have to do everything. And I, I, testing is going to be really easy because I know exactly how everything works. And uh. It's going to be really tough because I have to program everything myself and do all the art myself and the music and have to like do everything. But, you know, I am the game designer. I'm the top dog. Freedom. Yes. So I got them there. I got them. Yeah. And it's all my ideas. <laughs> oh, it's tough, man. Like, you know, like there were even like some people, there was at least one person who thought that when game design they meant like uh, officials, you know, like I want to do the art for games. And then that that's the case, you really need to go to art school. You know, like that's not what we mean with game design. But, you know, that's uh, understandable, you know, because really, you know, game design, it's so new. Like it's so incredibly new. Like it's all, it's all shit. Like it's all built on what gamers think is the way, you know, all these genre names, you know, I've done videos, you know, I got, got a new, I got like two more videos coming out on genres. Like, what is a roguelike? Well, nobody knows. It's kind of like on Wikipedia. It's like, you know, like technically roguelike is a word. And, you know, the Berlin interpretation, interpretation that's a thing that happened. So, like, the source is all correct. But it's, is it useful? No. But it's technically correct that it is a thing and it's a word that's being used. So, but is it correct? Is it useful? No. Well, it's the same thing with playtesting. You know, like, is this game design good? Well, people like it. And so it's technically good. It's like that, but that's actually the great thing, right? Because you can you can be the next you, you can be the next um, I don't know um, Picard, you know, like you, you you it's like going through space, man. It's a new frontier. You can re redo everything. You can I I can actually I can I can write history because you know with books and movies, you know everyone's already that it's all kind of figured out, you know. It's, you know people say you know we haven't had like the. Uh, What's that movie? Citizen Kane of, uh, of video games yet. And it's like, you know, Citizen Kane, you know, like that was like a very experimental movie because of like a whole bunch of new like techniques in one movie. And it doesn't need to be, you know, we don't need a video game that's like shit, a whole bunch of like new techniques all in one, all in one game. We don't need that. You know, we can just have some multiple games, but even that, you know, like, uh, you, know, you you can you can you, as long as you just think about it, you can you can solve these problems. All these problems we're having, like what's what's the thing about uh, what's the difference between turn-based and action games? 
you know, that's kind of confusing. Well, you, you can you can solve that, which I've got I've got videos planned to explain that. You know, what, what's, what's up with Western RPGs and Japanese RPGs? I'm working on that video right now. I, I just need to fix, do some other videos, like do as a kind of a primer. And then I, I've got to fix, you know, I, I got solved. I do, which in that case, you're too, you're too late. Like you better make haste because I'm going to do everything. I'm going to be the one to make history. I'm going to be next Albert Einstein and you'll be too late. But you know, I've got so much. I've got so many videos to make. Maybe you make one before me. You know, if you can, if you can do it better than me. You know, so you can do that. But yeah, anyway, um, I gotta get off onto this book, because the thing about, the thing about is that I had some game design classes that, in my first year at one, and that one was pretty good. Very good basis they gave me, and I also had like a team semester. That was advanced game design. I actually made like a Unity game that was like that was like the best game, the best project I had, because I actually sort of kept up. You know, I, it, you know, it was tough because I procrastinated a lot. You know, it it was tough, but the game we made was actually like chosen to be the best because it was like a physics puzzle game with these rolling balls and you had to bounce it to the exit. You know, it was pretty. It was pretty good, and that was like advanced game design. There was a lot of play testing too. That was like like mostly play testing. Yeah, that was just like, oh, just play testing, you know, just don't make it too hard to merely, you know, like introduce mechanics, you know, that was actually, we already had that in game design. Yeah, but anyway, like game design class, that was really cool because they actually, that get class introduced me to extra credits and extra credits, like they've really fallen off, you know, like they even like got a, they completely rebranded the channel to a, like a history channel and the, and the extra get credits give gaming is like a separate channel now, like, and really to completely out of like stuff to talk about really you know like they're really it, it like in the beginning was really good you know back in 2014 because they had so much to talk you know, I, I learned a lot about that you know but you know they've also made a lot of mistakes it's a lot, a lot of weird shit you know said uh, they had a lot of things wrong and uh, really more than people realize because people always go like uh but uh you know, like games are too expensive to make or like, oh, I didn't choose to be a Nazi. Those videos people really focus on. But like, those are like the obvious ones. And, you know, like if you go and if you know a lot about game design, which, you know, back in 2014, I didn't. But, you know, I kind of, I kind of became the student, became the master. Because, you know, like, it, like, even though there's a lot ro wrong with the extra credits, it was a really good, like, like, uh, basis to work off of. You know, it's kind of like a, Charles Darwin, you know, like Charles Darwin, he, he was a pretty smart guy, you know, he, he, he really created a theory of evolution, you know, but he was also wrong about a lot of things, you know, like he thought that, uh, emo like how humans like showed emotion was like integrated into our DNA and then like some other woman came around and was like, no, no, Charles, it's about culture, it's about, it's about like they learn it from their parents, you know, it's, it's, you know, in different parts of the world, it's different, you know, like also he like married like his first cousin or something and so all his, all his children died of incest related reasons, you know, like no, you should have <laughs> not a smart thing to do, Charles. But it's, it's like that, you know, like, yeah, you know, like you're pretty to me now, but you know, thanks for the, thanks for the lessons. Now die. And that's what it was. Yeah, but they showed me, they showed me actually like only like two videos, but like I found on my own. You know, I just kept watching on my own and, um, like one one guy's in my uh, class, like he really hates his high pitched voice. Did not like that high pitched voice. Oh, he sure he didn't. He did not. But like the one video the show was on like aesthetics of play. That's a pretty useful one. Like uh, in in the in the moment it wasn't that useful, but I've made it kind of made it useful. That's the kind of thing you gotta do. Like sometimes she's uh, you know they teach you things about game design. It's like is this really useful? And then you gotta come up with like a reason, like a useful uh, thing yourself. But uh, yeah, and another thing about that is that about being a first year, is that they give you a list of books. And you as a first year, you're like, you're like, still like a in middle school mind. You know, because books are really important in middle school. Like you have to buy them. You have to, you have to. And you have to go like, put covers on them so you can like return them. And it, <laughs> in high school, it's like, oh, you get this whole list of books. So I got like six books, bought them like, only two of them I ever opened. One C sharp programming, which maybe I'll read that one, but I read like none of them. And mostly because you need didn't need most of them. Like it, it was never it was never assigned. But <laughs> this one, this one though was, was assigned. 
and I'll tell you a bit, little bit about that later. But so what happened at the end of the year, uh, your, your parents were like, oh man, you know, like let's sell them because we you can make a little bit of money back. Thing though is, you know, my sister they sold her book, she sold her books. Uh, I kind of procrastinated, too much of a hassle. But in the end, uh, I'm really happy because you know I got like a little bit of collection of books. You know, like these are my game design books. And like uh, you know, years after, you know, like you're in, you're in a computer centric, uh, you're doing computer centric edu education. You just get the PDF. That's what you did. You know, if you really needed it, PDF, like PDF, PDF, PDF. And even if you did, if they didn't have a PDF, if you couldn't find it, you know, it got passed around. But even then, you're like you know, just do it without a book. You know, like well, they're not gonna catch you. <laughs> just don't, don't, don't get the book. But yeah, so I got this library, and, I, and finally I decided to actually read this book because it's actually a game design one. Because at this point, you know, like it wasn't until like 2018, 2019, up up until now that I really started to really think about game design. I really got good at it. That I really started to formulate my own theories, and that's when it really got to a lot clearer. You know, because really, like this book, it's not very good. And that's not really this book's problem. It's it's all of game design's problem, you know, because it's all like a, you know, it's all written by a bunch of gamers, you know, or like you know, like where are the sources, you know, like I'm gonna write a book on game design. What are my sources? Well, games have only been around since the eighties, late seventies. Well, you know, like well, board games, you know, chess. Okay, you know that that's good, that's usable. But if we're talking about video games here. You know, it's it's different. It's still different. And even like on regular games, you know, like they're just there's things to play with, you know, like it's, it, you know, like chess. OK, but it's, you know, that's like that has a lot of like it's uh, it's very uh, dignified chess. Right. But even then, you know, Pashans, uh, poker. Yeah, there's game theory on that, you know, but <laughs> video games, you know, there's so much different because you know, there's like stories and there's a <laughs> There's a conditioning, it, it, it becomes insane. You know, so it's, what, where are your sources? Well, maybe there's some, some professor on game design, but what are his sources? You know, which is why, you know, why can I be a source? I can be a source. Quote me on Wikipedia. I said this thing. I said it. You know, like other people like, you know, in Berlin, they're like, uh, Rogue, like, what is that? Well, uh, I don't know. Like, let's just take these games and give points. And they're like, okay, that's our source. Okay, well, why can't I just be like, you know, that roguelike thing, that's done. Oh, okay, roguelike thing is done. Source, super awesome art bomb. That's some good shit. <laughs> but yeah, um, it, it's time I started talking about this book. Because, <laughs> is there anything else I want to say? No, I, I, no let's talk about the book, this book. Uh, this is Game Design Workshop. A play-centric approach a, a, to the creating to creating innovative games. What does innovative mean? Uh, it just means new. I get you know, that's what it means. Really, they should write a book on making good games. Uh, that's what I would have done. You know, something in the depths. Because even this book, you know, people they're kind of kind of wide-eyed here. Because um, they talk about VR a lot and like VR. Okay, you know, but that's like. You know, how do you make a good VR game? Well, let's start with making a good game. Because like VR just creates it, it's it's all in it's all in the complexity. It's all in in, in like the wet why, in the breadths, but the depths, that's what we need. We need like a good foundation, and we don't really have that yet. This is not a very good foundation. It was written by Tracy Fullerton. Yeah, with a foreword by Eric Zimmerman. You know, Tracy Fullerton. It was written by a, a, a gamer girl. Oh, it's a, oh it's a, it's a, it's a it's a girl. Oh. <laughs> No, actually, no, actually, they use um, it's actually kind of interesting, you know, because uh, you know, the main pronoun used is she, like you know, like the game developer, she can use this, you know, it's it's the. I I don't want to make this about you know, it's just something I notice, but you know, like she she is a character, she her personality comes out through this, because the thing about her is that she's a really big fan of Blizzard, yeah, a really big fan of Blizzard. Uh, yeah, it's just like the amount of times that Warcraft, Starcraft, Star Starcraft Two, World of Warcraft are mentioned. It's it's so often, you know, like, and really, it's kind, it's kind of, it's a very American. It, of course, it was written in America in two thousand fourteen, actually. Yeah, this is actually the first one 
they made another one in 2004. So every 10 years, they make it, they update it. Like this actually, they basically updated this one from the 2004 version with, with new examples. So you, like you can't tell, like it's as if this was written in 2014, which it was, but the base was from 2004, which doesn't really, mm, and, but maybe, you know, like uh, next year, 2024, they, the video is dated now, but <laughs> now, I've, now I've dated this video. But uh, next year, maybe maybe it's already working on the next one. So in that case, you know, Tracy, maybe you can use this video as like a, you know, like just a criticism, you know. <laughs> but yeah, like, uh, and the thing is very American. You know, there's there's all these designer perspectives in it, which are actually very interesting, the most interesting part, because it's just game designers like being like, talking about what they think is interesting. And uh, some of them are real big dicks. Like, you're like, oh man, I don't like this guy. Uh, some of them are cool. And then one guy is specifically like that guy. I hate that guy. There's this one guy, man. It has to do with Skinner boxes. Yeah, actually, I'll tell you about the Skinner boxes. I won't tell, read from this book right now too much. Because it's like, it, it's too much, of course. Like, I'm already talking for like 25 minutes. Like, it's not going to, it's not going to work. But it's very, it's very American. You know, like, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto is managed once, but otherwise it's all Americans. You know, uh, it's also not a lot of examples from like, uh, you know, Japanese games, you know, it's like, it's very PC focused as well, you know, because there's beside Xbox and of course, like game developers make games on PC, you know, but really like the, the setting is like, there's not much handheld stuff and handheld games are like the most interesting because they don't have good graphics to work with, right? They got to really do it on their, on their design. And so games like Wario Land 3, you know, like when I, when I was a kid, you know, I didn't like portal games, you know, because I, I want the GameCube games, you know, the games that were like, they were, they had more freedom, you know, they were, they were easier often, you know, now like the portable games are really more, most interesting because that's when the, like the real core game design goes on and they don't really talk about it a lot. You know, that's kind of sad, you know, very Blizzard, uh, which, you know, people are really sad about Blizzard, you know, because Blizzard sucks now and like Bioware is going on there, you know, like EA is actually like, it just came out that EA is like uh, canning people from the Bioware, like 50 people and like, you know, it's the... Uh, Unic it's, it's called Unicronic Arts for a reason, you know, like it's happening, you know, <laughs> Anthem didn't go out of well, it, it's what they do, you know, but I, I never really cared about Blizzard or Bioware or any of these, a lot of these PC, like, co PC companies, you know, like, I, I don't really care, you know, because they're just, you know, at the end of the day, like people make games, you know, not not, corp not, not these, uh, these names like uh, Blizzard, you know, and they, when they fire all those people, even like Rare, you know, Rare wasn't the same company after it was bought. You know, like you can't really compare that. But yeah, another reason why this book uh, is kind of annoying because um, it's really like, it, it's in chapters, right? It's in like parts. And the parts are, let me see if I can find it because I got I can, I can cover all everything I'm gonna talk about. Uh, where is this shit? Come on. Yeah, it's part one, game design basics. Uh, Part two, designing a game. And then part three, working as a game designer. So the first part is, it's basically written like they're explaining video games like to an alien. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, page 66 here. It's a little like that, you know, cause it's like, it's like, uh, what kind of, what kind of games have we got? You got a single player versus game, where a person just plays against a game. You got like player versus player, a cooperative play, team competition, and it's like, yeah, I, I know that, but that's not really that interesting, you know? You got, uh, oh man, you got what is a puzzle, actually, that, that was pretty interesting. You know, like, what is play? Uh, they compare fi Go Fish and Quake. The structure between Go Fish and Quake, well, single player Quake, they say it, and it's like, you know, like Go Fish. This is a game for three to six players using a standard 52 card deck. The dealer deals five cards to each player. And then like Quake's like, oh, in single player Quake, the player controls a character within 3D environment. It's like, you know, uh, and then they do a comparison. And it's like, you know, uh, that's kind of really basic. Like, it's like an alien, you know, like, eh, you know, aliens come under earth. It's like, eh, we heard about this game, Go Fish and Quake. Uh, the same game, right? I don't know why I'm doing this. It's an eh, LMAO. <laughs> well, actually aliens, they're actually very different. They have different structures because one of them is multiplayer and another one is single player and it's like hey, let me oh what the what the fuck holy shit Ooh. 
We don't have video games. We just smoke weed. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sorry, but that's kind of a... Because it's... Oh, man, I forgot to talk about that. But, okay. So here's what happens, right? I got this assigned to read in class from a class and the way that works is they're like uh, read to these chapters you know like and it's actually quite a it's actually quite a few and of course you're not going to do it, do it immediately you're going to wait till next week you know it's the evening before next class so what you do is I, I go sit in my room right and the light you know like my curtains are closed you know I turn the light and see yellow lights you know like really the light doesn't go f it, you know you're kind of tired like the light is not that bright as you want it to be it's all very dark you know, I'm laying my I'm laying up my legs on my bed. I'm sitting in my computer chair, and I'm just reading like this, and the words are just going through one eye and coming out the other, like, I, it's just it's just so boringly written. And like my English is really good, even back then it was really good. Like, so I'm, I'm not grasping it. And the be reason is the main reason, is in order to understand this book, and this of course the problem with a lot of game design, like uh, even like extra credits. A lot of game design, uh, you know, advice, you know, doesn't really make that much sense. It, there's flaws in it because of the whole, like, you know, like, what is, what is role playing? Well, people don't know that. Even people who are game designers don't know that. And you'll, in this book, you'll see, like, there, there's some people, like, this this lady who worked, like, for Mass Effect, who made Mass Effect. And she they, they were, like, stunned that in Mass Effect, like, you shoot, like, you shoot at enemies, and then the game rolls a die, a die, to see if you actually hit. And they, they were surprised that the people didn't like that. No, really, like, it, it's like, and it's like, well, yeah, of course they didn't like it, because why are you rolling a dice? Because you're making an RPG, because Dungeons & Dragons has dice. You know, Morrowind, Elder Scrolls Morrowind did it too. Like, it's like, you shoot the arrow, and the arrow hits the guy, like the hitbox hits him. But it misses, because they rolled the die. Like, what do we have hitboxes for? That's the whole point of having a 3D game, with like a 3D world with hitboxes, is that like, it's more like realistic, like, Dungeon Dragons is ma is played with pen and paper, choosing your imagination. So yeah, you gotta use dice, you know, because you don't have a fucking physics engine to work with, or like get projectiles with fit, unless you want to stab your friend. You know, like, oh, I, I I hit you. Look, you're bleeding. You know, but like they're shocked. You know, like so these people, they're not, <laughs> they're not all that smart. So in order to understand this, in order to get value out of this, you need to know a lot about game design already and so you my eyes are just glossing over it and what happens you go to class and they basically re-explain everything you were supposed to read in the book so nobody read this thing hell i'm probably the only person who read it because most people probably sold the damn thing when they were done with the year you know like i'm the only person who read this fucking thing and then you know, why don't they write these books for people to just buy them and read it not read them really and then sell because this book is thick like you cannot get through this unless you skip a bunch you know, like, you know, like, uh, glaze over it and only read the parts that seem interesting. Because it's, it's terrible. But anyway, here's one of those examples. And I actually found a use for this. So they have a whole thing on objectives. You know, in chapter three, working with formal elements. And there's all these, uh, this is these kinds of objectives. Like, one is capture. The, objectives in, the objective in a capture game is to take or destroy something of the opponent's terrain, units, or boats. Which... Take or destroy, you know, like a really issue of like a, you know, it's really kind of like, you know, if you're killing your enemy, you know, like you're playing that match. Okay. You're killing them, but you're not, you're not taking them, you know, like capture the flag is different from k killing people. You know, it, it's, it's, a, that's it. You know, like really that should have been two points because then the other one, the, the second one, second objective is chase. Your, the objective in a chase game is to catch an opponent or loot one. Okay. So that's kind of like a maybe like a Friday like a Evolve or Friday the Thirteenth that game or Tag you're playing Tag, okay. So if you're chasing someone, okay. If you're okay, but that one seems like very born out of like Tag, you know, like like you know, it's not. It, is it that useful? Like in a game, am I ever gonna, you know, like chasing something? Okay, some games do like Spyro. You gotta chase like a little squid guy. You know, that's a thing. But it's not, you know, it's good that it's one of them, but like there's only like, like eight of, like there's only like 10 of them. And then there's race. Okay, race, I get. Alignment. And that one's just like Candy Crush or something, you know? You know, that one's like Tetris. Is that really, 
You know, like, why is capture and killing enemies? Why is that the same thing then? Rescue or escape. The objective in the rescue or escape game is to get a defined unit or units to safety. Examples are Super Mario Brothers, Prince of Persia, 3D, Emergency. Like, they do it a lot, but it's like a specific game. Like, actually, in the index, it says, like, Sonic Chronicles. Like, one of the games they mentioned, Sonic Chronicles. Not Sonic the Hedgehog. That, that, that game is not mentioned. Sonic Chronicles, the Dark Brotherhood, specifically. It's, it's kind of funny. Like, single-player Quake, again. Like, why are you being so specific? You know, like, Prince of Persia, Emergency Rescue, Firefighters, and Eco. Okay, Eco, you know, like, uh, Last Guardian. You know, okay, that's like a... That's like a... That's an escort mission. Okay, but why Super Mario Brothers? Because you're supposed to get to the end of the level? Really, they should have split it up again. You know, like, getting to the end of the level, you know, you're escaping, uh, you know, rescue, you know, escort mission. It's not the same thing. It doesn't feel... And then there's Forbidden Act. And that's, like, really, like, one of those, uh, like, uh, board game things, you know, it's like... It's like, you're not allowed to say yes, no, or um. Which, like, okay, and maybe it's, like, you know, it's kind of, like, Among Us... But then they're also like, not included in the work of the show scholars mentioned previously, but interested nonetheless are objectives such as the following items. So they had to come up with their own. Like, construction. Okay, you know, Minecraft, you know, like uh, SimCity. Uh, exploration. Yeah, that's one of the aesthetics of play, you know, exploration, you're going to explore. But that's not, that's not an objective. That's just something people like to do. That's solution. With objective solution games to solve a problem. Puzzle, you know, a puzzle. Okay. You know, that's... That, that, that's pretty good. You know, that's good. Then there's Outwit. And it's like, isn't that the same thing as like, like eluding someone like Chase, you know? And it's all kind of, yeah, it's not very useful, but I did come up with like a use, like a little bit of a use. And it's uh, to create variety in your games. Because the thing is what I was thinking, you know, like Team Fortress 2, what's your goal? Well, your goal is to capture like uh, King of the Hill, like capture the objective and then keep that, you know, defend that for a time. But how do you do that? Well, you got to get the enemies off of the point. So, you gotta kill him, right? And it's like, you know, capture, you know, like, that's like your sub-objective. Or maybe you want to air blast them off. Maybe you just want to lure them off. Maybe you ask in chat, like, hey guys, can we take the points? Sure. That, that would sometimes happen. You know, like, so it's like a sub-objective, but that sub-objective is technically not required. It's just like the end result of the dynamics of the game. You know, like, we need to do this. What's the easiest way? Well, we got all these killing mechanics. Or, you know, do something like that, you know, like sub-objectives. And that's actually nice because then you can create some kind of variety, you know, like, like Destiny when it came out. There were a lot of like uh, horde modes, like, oh, the ghost has to scan this. Kill some enemies while I do this, you know, it's like, that's like uh, survive. Like, actually, why is survival not here? I would have put that here, you know, like, because you, you could go, look, because you could come up with all kinds of other like objectives, you know, like, what if you had alignment? What if there was an enemy that split into three and you had he would like be in like a perfect line? Like maybe like one of them is here and then like one of them is on the high ground and on the low ground. And you got like you were like a piercing shot, you got like like a circle strafe, get that piercing shot and like hit them all three at the same time. Like that one like part in hide light where you have to hit the wizards. Two wizards with like one magic spell. Remember that? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. You know, like that that could be like variety, you know, like enemy variety. Okay, maybe this enemy, you know, it's like, it's like in Metro Dread or like in a, a cat in a Resident Evil Two, you know, like some enemies you can kill, some enemies just can't be killed and you just need to escape them. You know, Mister X, X is gonna give it to you. And you know, Resident Evil Two is a really good example because you got There's all these zombies which you can't kill, but you know, you want to conserve ammo, so you gotta loot them. You know, so it's chase. Okay, but then you gotta do puzzles. You got, there's like zombies around, you gotta do like, oh, I can do a puzzle. Okay, so now you got like solve, solution, and now now X, Mr. X comes running in. Okay, now you got, it's a chase again. You're, you're surviving, you're like, it, it's it's three, like three things at once. It's a lot of variety. And that's that, that's when the game gets more fun, you know? Because when you're just doing the same thing, you know, killing, 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 killing. You know, Destiny really had a problem, it's just killing, killing. You know, a little bit of platforming, which we like platforming, you know. I mean, that's, I guess it's just rescue, like escaping or something, you know? But like you can use that. Problem is, they don't tell you that. They're just kind of like, oh, games have these kind of objectives, Mister Alien. It's like, hey, LMAO, how is it useful to me? That's not useful on Alien Planet. I I'm doing an accent. <laughs> I'm doing. I feel like I'm doing an offensive. I, but that's the Alien voice. Like beep beep beep. Maybe I should do a different one. 
Like, uh, Houdini! That's not useful for me! <laughs> how do I how do I design a game with, like, interesting objectives? Uh, pick one. Uh, I'm gonna make a, a rescue or escape game. Okay. Well, you're gonna make a very one-dimensional game. Yeah, you know, like, you would never talk about video games like this. Like, okay, guys, what kind of game are you making? Uh, I think, you know, the World of Alignment games uh, could use some more new games. You know, I think people are really clamoring for that, you know. Tetris 99 really left, you know, when that game showed that. Well, is that game still around? Well, Super Mario Bros. 99. Uh, <laughs> they didn't. But, you know, Tetris 99, yeah, they really left a hole. Time for another Dr. Mario. You know, like, that's, that's not useful. But that's... <laughs> That's kind of that's kind of the problem, you know. Like it, it's like telling it to an alien. You need to know a lot. It's actually more fun to make fun of it, you know. Like it is a good it's a good source of discussion. That's it, you know. Let's discuss this, you know. That's why I'm planning on making like a whole bunch of these videos where I talk about parts in this book, and then I can like share my thoughts. And you know, it's a, it's easier than just uh, making entire videos about them, like uh, with a script and everything. You know, just talk some shit, you know, whatever. But uh, actually, really funny about this uh, book. Which you'll probably read that uh, next time. You know, like, like the designer's perspectives are like the best part. There's like 30 of them. And you got like Richard Garriott, Gary Gygax. I don't think, I don't think they have him as a designer perspective. Because he, he might have already... Isn't he dead? Didn't he die? You know, because... You know, well, anyway, they got these three intros, basically. Because they got... Uh, first... What, what was it? Well, they got all these quotes. Then they got the contents. Okay, then they got a foreword, then they got a preface. No, really, like, like seriously, I... look, look. Forward. Preface. And then, acknowledgements, so credits, basically. And, and one of them, like, the forward was by Eric Zimmerman, so... It's like, it switches back and forth. Then we got image credits and copyright notices. And then we get an introduction. So three intros, completely unnecessary, right? Like, I guess a little bit pretty interesting because I made like notes with pencil, but like, is it necessary? But anyway, now it's time to talk about Skinnerbox because I wanna, Let's highlight that, because they actually do manage the Skinner box, and it's actually through random chance that I found it, sort of, because I was looking at the index, and the index is really funny, because they got like, they just got words, and then they tell you what page to find it on. So it's like the H, like letter H, you got Haggle Game, Half-Life, Halo, Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 4, Hanafuda, Harry Potter, and the Order of the Phoenix. Again, very specific, We got because who hasn't played Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix? I mean, I only played like uh, 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 Harry Potter in the Goblet of Fire. Oh wait, no, 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 I don't. I've never, I've never played that game. I do own Hogwarts Legacy. Yeah, and I, I, for my PlayStation combo, of course. Like, yeah, I actually, I actually got them right here. Let me, let me see if I can get to it. Yeah. Careful, careful. Okay, where, where are they? Where are they? Come on. Uh, Harry Potter. Let me find this. Let me find this. It'll be funny. Come on, let's play PlayStation Two. Come on. This will be funny, seriously. Uh, no. No, it's not funny anymore. I ruined it. No, I've ruined it. Is it over there? I don't think, no. Okay, I've ruined it. I should have prepared it. But I didn't. But, oh, fine. Uh, so it's like that. <laughs> so then we go, I, I happened to look at the S because I was looking for something else. I don't know, man. Actually, actually the letter X is funny. Because it's only like eight. There's this X Plane, X E O Design, XCOM, Xbox 360, Xbox 60. Although I think that it's just like page 60. Yeah, it's page 60 and page 94. So it's almost like there's an Xbox 60. You know, they should have had the Xbox 720. And then just X on page 182. What is X? Maybe it's Twitter. <laughs> Maybe that's what they're talking about. 182? No, I'm not looking that up now. We, we don't have time. I gotta finish this. So I go to the S, right? And on the S, you got uh, Scrum, you got San Marco, Seth, the seventh guest. Why is it on the S? It, it, actually, there was another one where it was like two, like the T. There was just the T. 
the letter T, and at the end is like 2D prototype. Why is it under the letter T? I don't know. But anyway, letter S, and there's like a lot of S's. Actually, the most. Oh man, P. The letter P. Oh man, there's a lot of things with the letter P. Pac Man, Pan Pandemic Studios, Paradox Control, Parapet Rapper, Parcheesi, Party Rub, Passage, blah blah blah, Pinball, Pick Pick Pin. Pitch materials, or oh, there's like multiple, because pitch materials is named, it's like mentioned on like like 10 pages. Plans for zombies, uh, player engagement, play testing, play. Oh yeah, because the, this game is all about play. So like play in the design process is named like 10 times. Players, the word players is set, it's mentioned like six times. Player engagement, play interaction, Pokemon, pole position, portal two, portfolio power-ups, premise, Natalie Posey. Prince of Persia, Prince of Persia 3D. But anyway, the S, you've got like, uh, you got the Soul Calibur 2, Sonic Chronicles of Dark Brotherhood, Space War, Space Invaders. But then you got, you got Sinistar, you got Sissy Fight 2000, which is a real game. Like, they actually have a whole piece about that game. You can still play it if you have other people. Yeah, we'll talk about it another time. But then you got, under Skoo, Skinnerbox. Page 356. So I'm like, did they mention the Skinner box? Well, surely what they're gonna do is say that skin boxes are bad. And then uh, and then be like uh, <laughs> they're not gonna do that. They're gonna be like, oh, you know, skin boxes, don't put those in your game. Don't do that. Now I swear the section was called, it was in, was some, called something like uh, how to make people play your game. But I think I just read that somewhere else. I think it was on the internet, there was some other source I had. But no, this is in chapter 11, fun and accessibility. Yeah, and they, it's really weird because like, the way it's written, this book, it's they go and like, they can't really keep a focus. Like, it's it's really difficult because they don't keep a focus. I keep more of focus in this video than I do in this book. So rewards and punishments. And the weird thing is, it's like actually starts on page 255. It's also mentioned on page 256, like once, but then it's like a continuation. And then, but it starts on page 255. And then there's like some pictures of being stealthy in teeth. Actually, you gotta see these. Being stealthy in teeth. Yeah, you're being stealthy. In teeth. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, rewards and punishments. And I'm, I'm gonna have to skip through this a bit because it's like a really long part. The most direct consequences for player choices are rewards and punishments. So it's kind of like puff love, you know, like you want to reward players, but you don't want to punish them for too much. You know, that's kind of what's going on. You know, it's like, a, you know, it's all about condition, right? That's what it's about. Think of a game that forces the player to be stealthy, like T4 Deus Ex. The tension when you're trying to accomplish a task without being caught is tremendous. Getting caught and attacked, and let's face it, killed is not fun. <laughs> Getting killed is not fun. Not fun. But that moment when you oh so quietly pick a lock and sneak past the security bots without incurring any harm is made much more effective by a threat or that the envelope of punishment was hanging over your head all the time. So it's like it's tension, you know, it's like it's like an inconsistent win. Like you don't know if you were gonna win. Going with a balanced system of rewards and punishments is a way of making the choice in your games much more interesting for players. And that's true, like people need people need like dopamine for it to an extent, right? Okay. But where it gets different, um, let me see. That used to, when you develop your reward system, use the following guidelines. These guidelines suck. Guideline one: rewards that are useful in obtaining victory carry greater weight. Okay. But then guideline two. Rewards that have a romantic association, like magic, weapons, or gold, appear to be more valuable. How is it different from carry greater weight? Like, so it's saying, like, um, it's like, it's like, it doesn't want to say the same thing three times. That's what it feels like. It's like, uh, you know, give players rewards that are useful to them, like new weapons. Okay, I understand that. Why are you going to say greater weight? They carry greater weight. Yeah, well, if I'm encumbered. If the sword is too heavy, sure. And it's like, oh, you know, magic, you have new web magic and weapons. But isn't that useful? Aren't magic and weapons useful in, in obtaining victory? Uh, you know, romantic, it's like, oh, magic, that's really cool. You know, but if you're given like a pen that it's like, oh man, a pen, 
I mean, this is useful for when I want to write my paper in game, but uh, yeah, it's, it's useful in fiction, but uh, it's not it's not romantic. I know, and then <laughs> guideline number three, rewards that are tried in tight into the storyline of the game have an added impact. So it basically like uh, make them useful and make them cool and have them be part of the story. That's, that, that's what they're telling you, but that's not clear. It's unclear. They're trying to be too fancy about it. But anyway, I have to get to the skin the box part. Make each reward count. If you can both push the player close to victory and advance the story, that's even better. Okay, here we go. The timing and quantity of rewards are also critical. If you give a steady stream of small rewards, it can become meaningless. Players know the rewards are coming. No matter what they do, and they stop caring. <laughs> they, they know the rewards are coming, no matter what they do, and they stop caring. You know, you, the rewards have to, they have to do, put efforts. They have to put in an effort, like press a button. And then it feels like they wrote, like they earned it, right? Psychologist Nick Yi, who is a psychologist, who probably knows a lot about uh, Skinner, Skinner's theories. You know, he's a psychologist. So here we go with these psychologists and fucking game design, oh my God. Has, stu like, has studied the reward punishment structure of an extremely addictive game system, EverQuest. So right there, they're just like telling you EverQuest is addictive, which of course, because it's it's an MMO and they need to be addictive to so keep people playing. Because otherwise you got a dead, dead MMO, you don't want that. You know, you got the numbers, you got to make the numbers go. So already it's like, oh, EverQuest is addictive? Oh, that's bad. Isn't that bad? You know, World of Warcraft is also, because you know, like, Big Blizzard fan, World of Warcraft mentioned a lot. You know, you know it's addictive. You know, it, it's a skin box, and that's bad, right? Isn't that bad? Well, they don't really want to go into the moral question, which is also always the problem with, because uh, uh, these people they, they really want to be seem smart, so they're like, oh, I've been researching this. I'm a psychologist. Oh, skin boxes. Okay, but what do we do with this information? Uh, nothing, and you'll see that. So, uh, and he believes its addictive power lies in a behavior theory advanced by B.F. Skinner called operant conditioning. Oh, okay. We're just getting into it now. It's just, it's just right there. You know, I'm reading this like, you know, I read this book. If I read this back in 2014, I'd be like, I don't know what this is. What are they talking about? Like, and it's like, it's not made clear that it's important. You know, any person reading this is going to go away thinking like, oh, I guess that wasn't important. Operant conditioning claims that the frequency of performing a given behavior is directly linked to whether it is rewarded or punished. Well, that's that's just, that's Pavlov. You know, it's, it's Skinner is built on Pavlov. If a behavior is rewarded, it's more likely to be repeated. If it is punished, it becomes suppressed. It is usually explained by using the example of a Skinner box. A Skinner box. A glass cage equipped with levers, food pellets, and drinking tubes. I don't know why they mentioned drinking tubes. Because those are just there so the, the rat doesn't fucking die of dehydration. You know, they might as well say, oh yeah, yeah, the, the skin box also has oxygen in it. I don't know why. But it's it's part of, you know, it's, it's in there. It also has a floor and a ceiling. And walls. Don't know what those are for. Rats are placed in the cage, or pigeons and rewarded with a foot pellet for pressing the lever, using reinforcement to shape their behavior. Yi writes, so then she just quotes Yi, what Yi said, you know, the psychologist, who's going to tell us about operant conditioning. There are several schedules of reinforcement that can be used in operant conditioning. Well, really, no, like, I talk about a lot of skinner boxes, but you got a lot of different ones. Uh, the operant one is where, as you keep pressing it, like, it's a random amount, and it, like, keeps increasing. That, and then it becomes, like, operant. But then, then this guy says, the most basic is a fixed interval schedule and the, and the, and the rat in the Skinner box is rewarded every five minutes regardless of whether it presses the lever. That's an operant. It's just, that's just a schedule. It's just like, oh, you know, like, that's just, here's food. You know, it's like uh, my sister has like this automatic cat feeding thing. Every 12 hours, it, sh it just spews out some food. Okay, and like the cat like gets used to that. It's like, it, it knows. It knows when the food's coming because, like, if you put it on the on the hallway in the hallway, it'll start scratching your door, like exactly like that time. Like, hey, I know food is coming, and it actually comes. And you're like, oh, that's why you were scratching the door. Okay, so like, it is conditioning, 
about around, around time, but not operands, really. Yeah, it's, it's kind of complicated, yeah. Unsurprisingly, this method is not particularly effective. Uh, effective at what? It's pretty effective, like, at teaching them the significance of a time. If you want them to come to that location every, every, every day, it's very effective. You know, but it's not effective to make them press a button. That's it, you know, because, you know, I'm pressing this button, but nothing happens, okay? Another kind of reinforcement schedule is the fixed ratio schedule, and the red is rewarded every time it presses the lever five times. This schedule is more effective than the fixed interval schedule. The most effective method is a random ratio schedule, and the red is rewarded after you press the lever a random number of times. That's the upward conditioning. Because the red cannot predict precisely when it will be rewarded, even though it knows it has to press the lever to get food, the red presses the lever more consistently than in the other schedules. A random ratio is also the one that EverQuest uses. So basically what he's saying, um, this game EverQuest is treating you like a lap rat. It's manipulating you. That's basically what it comes down to. And of course, you're not really supposed to say that. Because, because I, like again, like somewhere online, it was like how to make people play your game, you know, which like, you know, manipulate them, you know, like if you want play, players, players to play your game for a long time, you know, uh, use, use a skin a box. And is that good game design? On a moral level, no. Right? But it's effective. And that's kind of what I think, you know, if you play this and people are like, oh man, I played this game 4,000 hours. But then after the dawn, they're like, oh man, what did I do for the thousand hours? You know, like they were they, you know, they got like kind of addicted to the dopamine. You know, is it moral? No, but it's effective. And a lot of people don't, yeah, they don't want to accept that their favorite games manipulate them. Because you know, like EverQuest is like really people are like, oh man, EverQuest. Oh, the quests were so cool because they were actually like, yeah, you know, actually I'll give EverQuest that, you know, at least the quests were more involved. But like Still skin box, guys. Like, MMOs are just built on that. that. That's just... That's just what the case, you know? Like, people don't want to accept that. So you get stuff like this. Where people, like... You know, like... Talk about rewards and punishments. Oh, let's talk about skin boxes. Okay, but where is this going to go? What are you gonna... What, what is the conclusion? Well, this might seem surprising. If you relate to your own actions in games and in the real world, it begins to make more sense. Really? Because I think it actually makes a shit tons of sense. Like you're onto something here. It may seem surprising, yeah. But you're actually a rat. You're actually being manipulated. It seems surprising, yeah. And it's like, yeah, it is surprising. Kind of distressing. Yeah, but don't worry. Just, just forget about it. Have you ever sat down to play five minutes at a slot machine? Now they're going into the gambling. And looked up to realize you had been there determinedly pulling that lever for several hours? In many ways, Las Vegas is simply a giant scare box. Oh wow, German 985 is a fucking pigeon. Like he's a big, he's a big gambling addict, man. So it's like, he is. Oh, you all know it. <laughs> that depth, man. Oh. But yeah, like it's just saying, oh, Las Vegas is a giant scare box. All those people are rats. That's kind of fucked up. It's kind of fucked up. Maybe something should change. Maybe this should be like, you know, like become illegal or something. You know, we might all be just rats in a cage. <laughs> just saying that, we might all just be rats in a cage. Okay, that sucks. How do I get out? Do you have advice for me? But there is one type of reward that is very powerful and it cannot be delivered like a pellet and that is peer recognition. They're just changing the, the subject. We're all rats in a cage. Oh, but this is like peer recognition and like that's true because, you know, like food. Eventually you just fall. You know, but like, you know, things like money and peer, like uh, achievements, you know, fame, you know, th those things are infinite. And that's why they're used in games, you know, like loots, gold, experience points on levels. Those are infinite. Like there's no, there's no biological limits. Like, you know, like you can reward me with food and water and like, you know, like a sexy time all you want. But, you know, like, so I need to rest, you know, I'm full. But like, so they just kind of move on. We crave acknowledgement for achievements, especially in multiplayer games. And there's a way for you to make the players, even the ones who are not winning, feel recognized for the efforts when they do achieve a goal, then you will have a much stronger game. Yeah, much more addictive. And then they go on with like many games do this through the internet, tracking scores, providing tournaments, you know, like like Call of Duty. You know those games where they're like uh Ultra Kill. Like like those skill streaks, like oh a tillery kill streak. Those are dopamine hits. You know, just like those dopamine hits. The problem is as you like there's matchmaking so a lot of these games really depend on like 
matching the good players with like a lot of bad players so they can just dominate and get all the dopamine. But when matchmaking comes in for like with, when they added that to Fortnite, you know, uh, that's when players get more frustrated because the dopamine hits, it takes some more effort to get those dopamine hits and then they get frustrated. You know, it's like the whales, are, it's, it's all fun for the whales when they'll eat on like the shrimp. But then when they have to fight each other, you know, like they get, they, they like fight and then one of them wins. And then they're like, you know, they're just, they won, but they're battle scarred, you know, like, you know, like when you have a team of 12v12 in a Call of Duty match and nobody's playing as team, they're just going for the dopamine hits. We want, I want a 30 kill streak so I can get the helicopter, I get the radar, but there's only so many enemies to kill. So you're competing with your teammates over the enemies to kill because, you know, like assists don't, don't count, but you're also competing with the enemies who are killing you. So as better players get matched, you know, the frustration rises. Like it's actually very operant conditioning because the, the win becomes more inconsistent. And that's when toxicity happens. Players get more frustrated. You know, it's like, oh man, I just want one more win before I go to bed because I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm, I have toxic. I have, I have toxicity. I need to release that. I need to get my dopamine. I need to get my fix. <laughs> hey, let me go. <laughs> but that, that's, and that's kind of what they go on. on. Like uh, you have to like, Provide recognition. If it's an if it's an online role playing game, allow the players to show off their conquests to the world, either in the form of legends, artifacts, and admirers who follow them about. And that that just goes back to like loot boxes in Team Fortress Two. You know, like those people who have those unusuals. They're gambling addicts. They spend so much money on unusual, and then they go bully people who didn't who are not gambling addicts. So if you're wearing a gibbous, well, I'm gonna bully you because you're not supporting Falp. That's how I rationalized it to myself. I'm not a gambling addict. I'm simply supporting the game, which you know, you know like a lot of people will play free to play games for like you know Genshin Impact. I, I had the guy, who, like, he tried to sell Genshin Impact to me uh, along with a whole bunch of other anime, and I was like on to him, you know, like I'm like, well, well, it doesn't Genshin Impact have like a uh, loot box? You know, that's like gambling. You know, it's like bad for people. And he's like, well, you know, these people are just weak, and it's like you know, if there's anyone who's weak, I didn't say that because I was, you know, I'll tell you a story some other time, you know. Uh, if there's anyone who's weak, it's him. Because he probably spent like, what, like 500 euros at least on the game, you know? Like, he's like, you know, he's got all the cute girls, you know, he's buying all those skins. You know, he's the one being manipulated. And then rationalizing, oh, people will admit they have a problem, those are the weak ones, you know? And if you admit you're being manipulated, you know, that's... You, you can, like, fight against it, you know? That's it, you know? Like, those people just... They just, like, spend a shit ton of money, some cost fallacy happens. They rationalize it to himself. They are so active. They have toxicity. They get toxic. You know, like they wrecked it off to the bad players they can bully. That's what happens. So, and then like, so, you know, it's at like page 256. They do mention the word skin box again in anticipation. Because, you know, you got to anticipate the win. Like, oh man, am I going to win? It's inconsistent. And they say like, the skin box example works well for game mechanics that are repetitive and apt to become roads. For larger, more complex choices, however, the more clearly you allow players to see and dissipate, yeah, this whole pink thing about choices before this, the consequences of the actions, the more meaningful the choice will be. Which, you know, the part about choices, I want to read, you know. But yeah, that's, uh, after that, they don't talk about skin boxes anymore. You know, but, you know, that's it. You know, they talk about, that's it, man. So, what was the point of that? What was the point of them, like, even bring it up? Why did they bring it up? I don't know. And the answer is, they don't know either. Because the whole point of that was like, I'm writing a book on like video games. Uh, I heard somewhere like, there was a thing about psychologists, you know, the psychologists are being hired by game companies to make games more addictive and stuff, you know, free to play games and all that. And I got to write something because this was 2014. You know, loot, the year of the loot box had not happened yet. But it was all micro, it was, it was free to play games, uh, pay to win. You know, Dead Space 3 had just come out and they were like, oh, you can... But pay money to upgrade your weapons, like, oh, fuck this. And now that's all, like, that's not even, like, the worst thing anymore, you know? It's... And so, like, they're, like, they got this psychologist. You'd be like, oh, well, this psychologist, he's going to tell us something about B.F. Skinner. And what do I do with this information? Well, nothing. You don't do anything. Like, how am, how does this make me a good designer? It doesn't, because I don't know what I'm doing. It doesn't give, it just doesn't really give you concrete, like, <laughs> information, you know? Like... Back then, I wouldn't have, I would have just read over it. You know, and that's it. You know, I, just one eye in, one eye out. You need to be very, like, you need to be, you need to be the expert. Like, you need to be the expert already. 
I should be grading this. Like, hey, this is all, <laughs> you know, but you know, it's just, in it's, it's in its baby phase, you know, it's in its uh, game design, it's in, in its infancy. And that's why, you know, I guess that's why I got such a big job ahead of me, you know, gotta make all these videos, gotta explain everything, gotta explain all these genres. And, you know, I guess, you know, that's a blessing and a curse, you know, because, uh, you know, maybe, maybe one day you'll read the Wikipedia page on me and like, you know, everyone will be like, oh man, super awesome, Marpong. Such a smart guy. He knew it. He fucking knew it, man. He knew it. Or maybe someone will have, have, you know, like, learned from me and become the master's master, you know, be like, oh, this guy, yeah, he was pretty good, but we got more. You know, he was wrong about some stuff, you know, that's cool. Because maybe then I can go with retirement. But yeah, it's just, it's just so sad, you know, like, like they knew, like people have known about skin boxes, but they don't, they don't want to talk about it. They want to talk about, they don't want to talk about the moral sense. And in a sense, you know, that's because, you know, they're too close. Maybe, you know, like they're gamers and gamers, you know, they, they're very defensive, you know, you know, like, what are you going to do? Like uh, say that, uh, you know, even say like, they just called EverQuest a skin box. Well, you know, like I can call a whole bunch of like, you know, I can call, I can call Final Fantasy VII a skin box. Extra credits called Final Fantasy VII a skin box. But then they backpedaled on it. You know, like, what are you supposed to do? You know, well, you're supposed you make a stand. That's what you do. You know, you're just going to say, this is like this. We should do this. And then people can say they can agree or disagree. You know, and then you kind of draw a line in the sand. And don't be like this. Don't be like this where it's like, yeah, games work. They kind of work like this, aliens. And then the aliens go, okay, we kind of we kind of understand how they, what they're made up of. But what do we do with this information? And the answer is, well, I don't know. You, you, the, the, the good game designer takes, they think about that. And I guess that's the ultimate thing. You just have to think about it. You got to do it yourself. You got to test and you got to create your own theories or find someone who has already done that and will, is willing to give you someone a concrete answer. And then you can say, you know, is this true? Is this false? Let's talk about that. You know, I I, I gotta I gotta finish this video. Uh, anyway, th thanks for watching. And the next video is uh is going to be on the all the game like genres. You know, all those people go like you know oh man this is Souls like or this is a rogue like. You know why those genres exist? And after that, I'll make my video on Western RPGs versus JRPGs, and that one will have a very clear answer because that's what I'm all about. Those clear answers, man. You you you're not gonna believe what I have to tell you. You're not gonna believe it, man. Which is why you should subscribe and subscribe and donate to my Patreon, which I have now. I made one. Yes. So if you're like, you know, I want a concrete answer. I don't want those videos anymore where people are like, oh man, uh, the difference is that uh, you know, like uh, in Japan, you know, they just role play different or something. And uh, you know, like you know, like this is why they're different. But we're still gonna keep using the same terms, which are confusing. You know, like yeah, we don't have anything better. I got something better. I got something way better. You know, I'm not just gonna go like, yeah, just, you know, like this, you just don't understand, man. You just don't understand the difference. You don't, you don't get it. They make sense. And these are the differences. And now we're gonna keep them like that way. And then like five years later, someone's like, well, why is it like that? You know, it's not right. I don't understand. And it's because they're wrong. But I'll tell you all about that later. But anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, Peace out.